Beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I enjoyed that one. <laughs> I remember, of course, in these changing times, let me share these verses with you again. We did it first hour. First from Isaiah 33, he will be the sure foundation for your times. And we live in a time when we need a sure foundation. A rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. And it is the fear or the respect of the Lord. This is the key to this treasure. That is respecting him and his word, obviously. And what Nahum said in Nahum chapter 1, the Lord is good, is a refuge in times of trouble. And he keeps on caring for those who keep on trusting in him. These are great words for the time in which we live in these changing, challenging times of 2021. But God has selected this time to put you in time. (laughs) So that means he has something for you and he has something for me. As long as he leaves us here. And it is our privilege and opportunity to serve our Lord Christ. The announcements, of course, uh, haven't changed. So therefore you can see them on the screen. Things remain basically as they are for the rest of this month. We'll go ahead and spend a few moments in silent prayer once again so that we might exercise the privacy of our priesthood to make sure that we are in fellowship. This means, of course, you have the option to rebound or confession of your sin silently and privately to God if necessary, or take any measure which might be necessary for you to concentrate on the teaching of the Word of God this morning. All right? So let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this another opportunity to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for telling us, reminding us, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We know also, Father, that every word that comes from you comes with great power. We know that heaven and earth may pass away, but your words will stand forever. So we thank you, Father, for the sure foundation that we have in your word, the sure foundation of our faith and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to live at this particular point in human history and in the po- at this point in the angelic conflict, to be here to represent our Lord Jesus Christ. It's our prayer that the things that we examine this morning will be that which will be utilized in our life to honor and to glorify our Savior. So we commend our class to you now in Christ's name. Amen. (coughs) All right, let's see if we can't pick up where we left off. We are in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we have been studying at verse 17. That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This obviously is the very reason for our scripture, for the very reason that all scripture is God-breathed, it is profitable for spiritual preparation so that you and I as men of God, man and woman, women, the man of God here, of course, is a generic term uh, for the human race. And so that you and I might be uh, fully adjusted so that we might be completely and totally equipped, that we might understand that God has made this adjustment or the means of this adjustment and the means of this equipping available to us with reference to our spiritual life. All right, so we've seen for the purpose that, uh, for equipped, I'm sorry, for every good work. Now we left off with this phrase, for every good work last time. So Paul pulls it all together for us uh, at the end of this verse. And we have some interesting words here. Pros, of course. Pros, pos is the Greek. Agathos, ergon. Now this phrase uh, is very vital for you to understand because the good here agathos is not kalos it's agathos and it means good of intrinsic value what that means what that indicates is the fact that there's some things that wherever you find it 
it has intrinsic value. Uh, we talk about gold, for instance, uh, whether it's on a lady's lovely finger or in the ring of a sow, uh, it still has intrinsic value. It's gold. If it's pure gold, of course, it has intrinsic value. So agathos is often used to emphasize the principle of intrinsic value. What God wants done in your life is that which is of intrinsic value. You and I have no means whatsoever of producing intrinsically good that which is of intrinsic good of value or intrinsic value in our own life. Not from the spiritual standpoint. We have no means of doing this. However, God does. And whatever God does is always good. God always produces that which we might entitle agathos, good of intrinsic value. God never does anything that is not good. So obviously, in many, many passages, when this word agathos is used, the emphasis is on the fact that God is interested in doing something in your life so that what he is able to do in your life becomes intrinsic good. It becomes of intrinsic value. Now that's important because when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the only thing that God's going to be interested in is the gold and the silver and the precious stones. And that's only going to come as a result of what he does in our life. If we operate on our own, like we were talking last hour, it's going to be wood, hay, and straw. And it's going to all go up in flames. But it is the gold and the silver and the precious stones. These are the things that have intrinsic value <clears throat> wherever you find them. So again, the idea related to the spiritual life is not what we do for God. It is what God does in and through us. He works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Sometimes his working in and through us is not necessarily to our pleasure. <laughs> Sometimes we would, from our own standpoint, like for it to be another way or done something differently than the way he has done it or is doing it. However, you and I must Er, must come to the understanding early in our spiritual life that that is not our call. That's God's call, not ours. And so therefore, agathos, ergon, means good of intrinsic value accomplishments and achievements. And this is what God does in us. We've just recently studied that concept, uh, I don't know how many classes ago, but uh, we went through some of the principles that God the Holy Spirit works in us the Word of God works in us to perform what God wants to accomplish in our life. And so, therefore, this is the concept and the principle uh, when it says that we have been equipped, we have been outfitted for every good work. In other words, you have received as a believer what is necessary for God to produce His plan, His purpose, His will in your life. However, you and I must stay, <coughs> stay in fellowship must be walking in the Spirit, taking in the Word of God, applying it to our lives. That's how God works, because He has two power options for us, which we'll see later on, that works in our life. God the Holy Spirit is the agent of power, and the Word of God is the source of that power. So these are the things that we must learn. All right, so this phrase, with respect to every good of intrinsic value, work, good, or accomplishment. The believer with the Word of God resident in his soul, that is, doctrine that you've heard, learned, circulating in your stream of consciousness, will be, you will be able to become totally adjusted and completely outfitted for everything the plan and the will of God requires of you. That's the good news, by the way. He will be able, the believer will be able to walk or live in the reality of the power of God working in him according to the will and the pleasure of God. He can know the certainty. You can come to learn and understand and know the certainty of what Paul means in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, you need to understand this principle. We are his workmanship, the Word of God says. You have been born into the family of God. God called you by his grace. And when you came and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you received a spiritual life. You received a destiny. You now are destined to be with our Lord Jesus Christ and destined to be conformed to his image. And so therefore, 
God has a destiny for us. We are His workmanship. God is the one who came up with this. We are born again. We are born into the family of God. We become Christians and believers, not by our own will or by the will of man, but by the will of God, Paul wrote to the Galatian believers. It's not on the basis of our will. It's on the basis of what God has provided through His grace. He has given us volition. He has given us a, a way and a means by which we can make a choice in our own life. We have free will. We can either accept it or we can reject it. And so therefore, God has made it possible for these things to become reality in our life. For we are His workmanship. And we were what? Created in Christ Jesus. Now you were not created spiritually alive until you accepted Christ as Savior and were placed in union with Him. That we refer to last hour as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For by one baptism we have all been baptized into one body, and we have been all been made to drink or possess that one Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, who lives in inside of you. So you have a spiritual life. And so God says, you are my workman. You have been created a spiritual individual now. You have been born again. You have now received a human spirit. And with that human spirit came God's plan and purpose and will for your life. And so this is the idea. We are created in Christ Jesus for what? For agathos ergon. The purpose for us being down here is so that God can work in and through our life and produce and achieve that which is intrinsically good in His plan and in His will. You've heard this, I'm sure. I heard it many, many years uh, in my early years as a Christian. You know, what are you doing for God, brother? What have you done for God today, brother? Well, I finally learned the answer to that. Not a thing. Now, let me tell you what He has done for me. Let me tell you what the opportunity I have because of what He has done for me, what He has created in me, the spiritual life that He's given me through faith alone in Christ alone, and God the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of me and given me His Word. And so that with the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God, God Himself then can produce the Christ life in me. That's what it's all about. And so sometimes we can sort of get twisted things. Man has a wonderful we're very apt in getting things turned upside down and inside out. I mean, we just get it backwards. And so, therefore, it isn't what we do. It's what God's done. And we've studied, of course, God's power system and the verses in the New Testament, especially, that talks about God's power working in us, the, word of the Holy Spirit working in us to perform uh, God's will and pleasure, the Word of God itself, uh, accomplishing its work in us. We've studied these verses many, many times before. All right, so he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works, agathos ergon, which God prepared beforehand. Oh, that's interesting. In other words, we're not just down here, hit, miss, willy nilly, going about it. No, no. God has a purpose, God has a plan, uh, God has a scheme, God has a method and a means, God has all of this. So not every day that we go into, you and I may say, well, you know, this is an uncertain day. Well, it is for us because we've never been here before, but God has been. In His omniscience, He knows everything that you're going to face when you leave this auditorium. He knows exactly what's going to happen in your life. In, in the next day or so, in the next week, in the next month, in the next years, God knows exactly what's going to come your way if He tarries. And he leaves us here for the purpose that He has for us. So He is able to anticipate, and He has a plan and a scheme for us so that we, you and I can maximize the spiritual life through our own volition, making good decisions, uh, from a position of the strength of the Word of God. And so therefore, God is able to be glorified in us as we make these good decisions. As we are filled with the Spirit, operating, walking in the Spirit, taking in the Word of God, using our faith and trust and dependence, our confidence that God knows exactly what He's doing. 
And so therefore, I may be faced with uncertain days, but I must understand that it is not uncertain for God. How could we say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Some people will say, really, did you hear the news? Do you know what's happening? Do you know what's going on? Let's go back a little bit. This is the day that God has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. How can we rejoice and be glad in it? The same way we can give thanks in all things and give thanks for all things. Because God has already made provision for us. We have to trust him. We have to be uh, Peter. And Peter, bless his heart. After I say that, I can say anything I want to about Peter. But anyway, you know that, of course. And once you say bless your heart, I mean, it's wide open at that point. I'm not going to say anything about you, Susie. It's okay. <laughs> All right. But Peter, he climbed over the side of that boat, didn't he? That was pretty uncertain times. Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you. Come on. <laughs> so the Lord says every day that you get ready to climb out of that bed over the side of that boat, he said, come on. <laughs> come on. I got it. I got you. Just come on. But don't lose sight, because during the middle of the day, if you look around and you say, oh my gosh, that was a bad wave. I know they come in series, and I know the next one's going to be worse. And at the beach, you always wait for the, here they come, you know, one, two, and then oh, the next one's going to be a good one, boy. Here we go. Well, sometimes we get to looking around at the wind and the waves and the crashing, and the, boy, the next one's going to be terrible. The next one's going to be terrible. God must not have known about this one that's fixing to come. So he says, listen, come on, Peter, you get out of the boat. Peter kept his eyes fastened on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He started walking right toward him. What a great lesson for us. Don't, don't try this at home. <laughs> but, anyway. but anyway, Peter had an opportunity to learn a very important principle and, of course, for us to learn the principles as well. Took his eyes off of the Lord. And the word says he got his eyes on the water. He got his eyes on the situation. And then what did he do? He became afraid. And that's what you and I have to guard against. Fear is slavery to circumstances. Faith, of course, is freedom in circumstances. We need to keep our eyes fixed on our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, God has prepared these things beforehand. He says, come on, I've got it handled. Whatever you need, Whatever, however you need to be adjusted, however you need to be equipped, guess what? I've got it ready for you. And so therefore you have to walk by faith. As a matter of fact, he says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk. Walk in them. That means to live in them. To walk in them. Uh, this word, uh, walk here, is the word peripateo. It has the idea of living in the word. Walking in those good works means living your life on the basis of the Word of God. Trusting Him. This is how you walk in them on a daily basis. You climb over the side of that boat and you start, start taking one step at a time by faith. By faith. That's the way we start out. At some point in your life, you had to come and realize, well, I know about God and I've heard about Jesus and you know, all about eternal life, and I've heard about the Bible, but I've never really trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've never really made that decision. So one day, whatever the circumstances happen to be, you made that decision. You realize that God has sent His only Son, and that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And this is the message, John says. That God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And he who has the son has the life. And he who does not have the son of God does not have the life. However, he says, these things we've written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the only begotten son of God. That's how John wrote in his first epistle, chapter 5. 
And so therefore, one day you had to make that decision. You had to decide to believe and trust in the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth. He lived. He provided eternal life at the cross. He paid for the sins of the world. He was buried. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we're waiting for his return. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's what you and I have to believe and receive if we're going to have eternal life. The moment you do that, God the Holy Spirit then baptizes you, i.e. identifies you. I'm not talking water baptism here. There's seven different kinds of baptisms. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptizo always means identification. And so therefore, God the Holy Spirit identifies you with Christ. How does he identify you with Christ? By borning you again. <laughs> By giving you a spiritual life. You became identified with your family as a child because you were born into that family. And so therefore, you are now identified with that family. So you and I come and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. God the Holy Spirit performs a spiritual birth in us. And in the unique aspect of the New Testament, makes us in a union with Christ by sharing his life with us. And therefore, God the Father provides everything for you that he provided for the humanity of his Son. You're no longer seen in yourself. I'm no longer seen in myself. I am seen in Jesus Christ. And those 40 things that we mentioned last hour are given to me instantaneously and simultaneously. And so therefore, I have received a new birth. I am born again in the family of God. And so I can have assurance and confidence of my eternal security. Nothing can ever separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, Paul wrote to the Romans. All right, so agathos, good of intrinsic value, and we should live in them because God has preordained them. That is, he knew them beforehand. Before you got here, God had a plan for your life. God doesn't make it up as he goes along. Now, you and I often have to try to make it up as we go along. God doesn't have to make it up as he goes along. He has a plan. He's the one standing behind you, saying, here is the path, here's the way, walk in it. That's what he did over and over and over again in the Old Testament uh, with the nation of Israel and with the nation of Judah. Here's the way, here's the path, here's my plan for you, walk in it. All you got to do is trust me. You trust me, I'll take you into the land. I've already defeated the enemies, all you got to do is believe me. And then you can live in the reality of it. I have power over the enemies. I have victory over the enemies. You trust me, and you can live in the reality of it. Listen, the same thing is said for us. We trust him. God has the power. He has defeated the world and the flesh and the devil. And so, therefore, we must take him at his word. And when we get into a situation and a circumstance, then we must take him at his word. We must believe that he has given us the victory in this situation. We must trust him. If we don't trust him, then our experience is going to be that of the children of Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years, never trusting him, and dying before you ever get to that life that God has provided for you. Don't let that happen to you. Just like Israel, God had the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. He had told them, listen, I've already run ahead of you. Uh, I've already defeated your enemy for you. All you have to do is trust me. If you'll trust me, I'll show you my power and show you how I can defeat the enemy. But what did they do? They came right up to the land, right up to the uh, county line, and said, we can't. We're afraid. We can't trust him. And God said, okay. You're going to wander around, and every one of you over the age of 20 will die in the desert. Then I'll take the children into the land. And that, of course, is what happened. In the, word, in the Old Testament, in, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with Moses, etc. All right, so we are to walk in them. They're already been prepared for you and for me, that we should live in them. We should walk in them. All right, the word walk here is the word peripateo. It's an aorist active, remember, subjunctive. Remember that from last hour? 
the subjunctive mood, is potential. Whether you walk in them or not is going to be up to you. Again, not up to your grandmama or your granddaddy or anybody else. It's going to be up to you. You have to make the decision to trust God in your own life. It doesn't matter who you are as a believer, what your status is, what your age happens to be. Uh, it doesn't matter. You have to trust him. You have to walk in them. You have to make that decision. The, the subjunctive mood is always potential, requiring a volitional decision on your part. All right, so there it is. So therefore, here's how we meet and defeat the opposition to the truth of God's word. It says it right here for us. You, however, continue in the things that you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God, or God-breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That was the message given to Timothy. Now, <clears throat> I want to look quickly at a doctrine or a concept that pulls all these things together for us. Uh, as we advance further and further into this uh, new and exciting year of 2021, and I think it's going to be a, an exciting one. All I can tell you is just hold on, because it's going to be interesting. We refer to it around here, we learned this years back, called the doctrine of peripatology. It comes from peripateo, of course, which means to, be, to walk, and uh, ology means the study of. So it's the study of walking, the doctrine of of peripatology is based on the word that was coined around here. We, this word was coined around here a few, bit, a few years back. This is the doctrine related to the study of walking as it relates to your spiritual life, the spiritual life of the royal family of God. And again, it is taken from the primary word used in the New Testament to describe the operation, the function, and the momentum in the spiritual life of the royal family of God. Remember, you are spiritual aristocracy. There's never been a category of believers throughout the word of God that fall into your category because you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has taken up residence in you. The Holy Spirit is in you and God the Father is in you. This is brand new. This never happened before in all of the word of God and will never happen again. You are a unique category of believer. You're a member of God's royal family. You're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You and I have become and been made a kingdom of kings and a kingdom of priests. We are king priests after the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which is a king priest order. And so therefore, you and I, are very unique as far as the spiritual world and the spiritual life is concerned. We are members of, God, of the body of Christ. We're uh, bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. We're one with him, according to his prayer in John 17. The prayer was that you and I might be made one with him. So now when God the Father sees us, he doesn't see us in ourselves. He sees us in his son, and we are members of his body. All right, so this is the concept here, the spiritual life uh, taken from this word, peripateo, meaning again, the, it is a description, the operation, and the function, and the momentum in the spiritual life of the royal family of God. All right, so let's introduce it a little bit. <coughs> there you are. We'll call you Roscoe. If there's anybody here with the name Roscoe, sorry about that. But anyway, right, you notice that there are three things. Walking is a great analogy uh, to three basic principles related to our life in general. Your life and my life must have balance. Our life must have momentum, and our life must have direction. 
And so when you talk about walking, uh, this fits very well, does it not? If you're going to walk, the first thing that you see a, uh, a, a child beginning to do is starting to move into his toddler years or whatever where he can walk is he's got to have balance. Got to have balance. And then, of course, he has to get momentum. Sometimes they don't get much balance until they get a little momentum, you know, going in the right direction. And they might, you lisp a little bit to the starboard or lisp a little bit, you know. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, they have to learn balance. Remember the first time you ever got on a bicycle, you know, which is you walking with wheels. That's all a bicycle is, learning to walk with wheels. And so you had to learn to what? Balance and balance and balance. And then, of course, you had to gain some momentum. And then you, of course, had to have <coughs> a direction in which to go. So again, you have balance, momentum, and direction. Living or walking in the spiritual life of the royal family of God brings these things to our daily life brings the balance, brings the momentum, and brings the direction. Under balance, I've jotted down a few verses that I want you to uh, read with me. The first one says, For my people have forgotten me. That's not balance. <laughs> they burn incense to worthless gods. Hello, America. We have our own gods, do we not? We have the American pantheon. We have wealth, uh, we have careers, we have sports, uh, we have all of these other things that take place, that take the place of our spirits. I'm talking about Christians now. Uh, the world, what do you expect out of the world? Worldly things, right? But don't love the world, nor the things that are in the world, because the things that are in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the, the vainful pride of life, arrogance. Don't follow the world, in other words. And so therefore, my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless gods. They have stumbled from their ways, from the ancient paths, that is, from the Word of God, to walk in the bypaths, that is, to take the detour, the route, uh, to go on the, my way, highway, rather than the, on God's highway. I'm way down my way, highway. I'm going to do it my way. Somebody ought to write a, sing, a song so I can sing it. I did it my way. Because so many things in my life, I'm afraid I did it my way. But all those are great songs, or whatever. You ladies can swoon, quit swooning now, whatever. But they stumbled from their ways, from the ancient paths, to walk in the bypaths, the detours that the flesh takes you, that the world would take you. The world, the flesh, and the devil want to get you on the bypaths. Take a detour here. And go in the other direction. Not on a highway that is God's highway. God's highway, by the way, is a smooth road to travel. The byway the bypaths, I should say. The My Way Highway, that's a rough road to travel. Rough road to travel. Because you find yourself, every time you turn around, nobody knows the trouble. We're drawn to songs like that, right? You are. Because there's something in you. Your emotion. See, that centers in on yourself. And nobody knows. Paul says, nah, that ain't true. There's no temptation taking you that such isn't common to man. Who do you think you are? You know, the only one who faced so many unique situations in this life was our Lord Jesus himself when he went to that cross. No one traveled that path but him. So, but we like to think that, don't we? So, the My Way Highway is a rough road to travel. The selfishness, the arrogance, the self at the center. I'm telling you, that's a hard road to travel. God's highway on the other way, uh, uh, in the uh, other means, is the fact that God's highway is a smooth road to travel. On one hand, a rough road. On the other hand, a smooth road. All right, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 10. 
Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. How do you do that? Through your knowledge and your understanding of the Word of God. You gain confidence, assurance in your soul that you have eternal life and that God has a plan for your life. And not only does He have a plan for your life, He also has made perfect provision for you and given you and outfitted you what you needed to live it. Gain that confidence in your life on a daily basis. Therefore, brethren, be more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, and you want to find out what do things, you'll have to do it on your own. Verses 5 through 9, by the way, is what he refers to here. If you do these things, found in verses 5 through 9. Notice what he says. You'll never be off balance. You'll never be off balance. You will never stumble. Why did they stumble? Why did Jeremiah say, listen, my people are stumbling all over the place. They don't have any balance. Why? Because they have forgotten me. They've turned away from me. They've forgotten my word. They're not following my word. They're not following in the paths that are outlined in Scripture. They're following their own paths. They're taking a detour and following, cutting their own trail rather than following the trail that the, pla- that the trailblazer has already blazed for them. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus who is the trailblazer. He's the trailblazer, is what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells us. He's the one that has gone ahead of us. He made the way to live the spiritual life. He walked in the manner that God required him to walk. He gave him the means by which he could do that. Now he turns around and gives to us the same requirement. We are to follow in the steps of Jesus Christ because God has outfitted us. He has equipped us with the means by which we can do it. And so therefore, we will never stumble if that's what we're about. On one hand, stumbling by going our own way. On the other hand, taking the smooth road and doing these things that God requires of us. Then we will never stumble or be off balance. Now, Paul gives us the secret to maintaining our spiritual balance from day to day. He gives us the secret in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verses 15 and 16. Now, this is a very, very important part of your spiritual life and your spiritual growth and your spiritual walk. You know, and just, So just listen carefully. Philippians 3.15 says, So let those of us who are spiritually mature. That's where God wants to take you, by the way. To spiritual maturity. To grow you up. He doesn't want you to be a baby. He doesn't want you to stay in the crib. He doesn't want you to just be toddling around. He doesn't want you to just be eating baby food. He wants you to grow up so that you can live in the reality of His plan for you. So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. At this verse, you put verses 13 and 14. Verses 13 and 14. Philippians 3, verse 13. I wasn't going to do this, but I decided I would. Brethren, I do not regard myself. This is Philippians 3.13. I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. In other words, it is not finished yet. It's not over for Paul yet. He hasn't finished and gotten the final prize yet. He hasn't reached that point yet. And so, therefore, I haven't uh, reached it yet. I haven't laid hold of it yet. But one thing, this is what I'm doing. Forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, in essence, I haven't arrived in my spiritual life. I'm still here. 
So I haven't finished. God hasn't finished with me yet. I haven't reached the prize yet. I'm still advancing in my spiritual life. So what I do, I forget the things that are behind, all the things of the old life. Now I'm reaching toward the new life. I'm pressing on toward that prize and the high call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, accomplishing, seeing God accomplish and finish in my life His will, His purpose, and His plan. He did that. We're studying the passage in 2 Timothy right now, the letter from death row, where Paul writes his last letter, writes it to Timothy. And then after he accomplishes that, where he explains that he has fought the good fight and there's laid up for him now the crown of righteousness. And so therefore, he writes his letter, it's over for him, and he realizes and he knows it. And right after the accomplishment, or when he finished that letter, they took the Roman soldiers, took him out by the Appian Way, and decapitated him. And he was absent from the body and face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. He laid hold of it that day. He laid hold of it that day. And of course, we'll be laying hold of a lot of things at the judgment seat of Christ when he receives rewards and crowns at that point. All right, so it tells us that's the attitude that you and I are supposed to have. That's why he says here in verse 14, those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown, we need to have this attitude and hold these convictions. What? Moving on in the spiritual life. And if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, that is, that you're going to live your spiritual life in a different manner from what the Word of God teaches, God was going to make this clear to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have already attained and walk, listen to this, walk and order our lives by that. That is, live your life on the basis of what you learn from the Word of God on a daily basis. If you want to know more of the will of God, then you need to be doing what you know to be the will of God today. If you refuse to do the will of God, what you know to be the will of God today, are you expect God's going to reveal any more to you? No. You've got to live up to what you've learned. Learn to use what God has given you, what you've learned already in your spiritual life, in your life, in your relationships, in your situation, in your circumstance. You learn the Word of God, you put it to practice. You learn more of the Word of God and you put more into practice. You learn more of God's Word, you put more and more into practice. This is taking the mind of Christ from the Word of God and thinking the same thing. Let this mind be in you, he said in the previous chapter in Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5. Let this kind of thinking, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he explains the mind of Christ and the epitome of humility in our Lord Jesus Christ in that passage. So here it is, constantly, here's the principle, constantly applying what we have learned from the Word of God. See, that's continuing in the Word of God. That's the challenge. How are you going to face, confront, defeat the opposition of Satan, his conspiracies, his deceptions? I'll tell you how. By continuing in the principles of God's Word that you have learned. If you don't know anything as a, as a Christian except the fact that I'm saved, I receive forgiveness from God, and I have learned the principle that if I commit a sin, I can confess that sin and God forgives me and puts me back in fellowship. Use it. <laughs> Every day of your life, you use it. Because when you are filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, guess what? God is then able to teach you some more. Takes you then from the rebound technique, confession of sin, to the faith rest drill. Learning more and more how to mix the promises of God with faith. Learning how to expand your faith. You know how to expand your faith? Listen, you really, you don't get any more faith. And your faith doesn't come any bigger, actually. But you see, as you increase the objects of your faith, your faith grows stronger. The more you know of the Word of God and the more that you believe in the Word of God, the more that you learn about Jesus Christ and the more that you apply in your life, the stronger your faith becomes. That's the way it works. Faith is like a muscle in the soul. So the more reps you do, the stronger you get. The more you use it, the more apt you come, become 
in the use of those muscles. So the spiritual life is exactly the same way. And so therefore it isn't the faith that is the issue. Everybody has that. It's the object of faith that is the issue. And so therefore this is how we do it. Constantly learning, constantly applying what we learn from the Word of God. And I'll guarantee you, you will have spiritual balance in your life. You'll have that spiritual balance if you utilize the simple principles that you've learned on a daily basis. Then, of course, picking up, you not only have balance, you need to have some momentum in your spiritual life. And so that's why Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, listen, we live, we walk, how? By faith, not by sight. Because the things that we see, they're temporary. The things which are unseen, these things are eternal. So we need to walk by faith. We need to trust, depend on what God promises and has given in His Word. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's how you maintain your spiritual momentum. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, For in it, that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. This is the advance of your faith, the objects of your faith. This is going from one level of spiritual growth to the next level of spiritual growth, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall keep on living by faith. And to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul wrote, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, and to ask, <coughs> excuse me, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul always prayed for people, for believers to have a knowledge of the will of God, the Word of God, to be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why, Paul, why are you praying that for me? Verse 10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. There's your momentum. Walking in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, I told you, Paul also is a broken record. Knowledge of God, knowledge of God, knowledge of Christ, knowledge, epinosis knowledge of the Word of God, over and over and over and over again. Why? Because, remember the great challenge and one of the challenges of Client Nation America? My people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. I'm not talking about just academic knowledge. Uh, we admit that, that's gone astray too in our, in our nation. They're not, they're not teaching true knowledge today in our schools. They're not teaching them true history for sure. I don't know what they're teaching them. From what I can see, not very much at all. But that's another story, is it not? It's the knowledge of the Word of God that is so important. Increasing in the knowledge of God. And so Paul says to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 6, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, keep on walking in Him. Momentum by faith. Momentum by trust. Momentum by confidence. Momentum by application of God's Word to your situation and your circumstance. All right, thirdly, there is direction. If you're going to be walking, you might as well just walk in a direction, right? Don't be like the children of Israel wandering around in the desert for 40 years. They're just going in circles. Hey, a lot of believers, they're just going in circles. They're really not going anywhere in their spiritual life. Some of them are, going by, are, are fooling themselves. They're going through the motions. They don't really know what the spiritual life is. They think it's a set of rules that you have to learn how to do and strive to accomplish. Don't do this, don't do that, or do this, or do the other. That's not the spiritual life. The spiritual life is a supernatural life, and it requires a supernatural means of execution. And that's why you have the two power options that God has given us, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Both, by the way, are to dwell in you. 
the function in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You can never lose him. He's always going to be there. The Word of God is available now, and you can take that Word of God in, and it becomes resident in your soul, and God the Holy Spirit can take those things and bring them to your remembrance. And you can order your life according to the will of God. That's the way it works. All right. So he said the concept here of direction. Notice what Isaiah told his generation. He says, listen, your ears are going to hear a word that is communication coming from behind you. It's going to say this. This is the way. Walk in it. This is the way you should go. Go this way. This is the way that you should go. Walk in it. Whenever you start to turn to the right or turn to the left, the Word of God is going to say, ah, <laughs> that's not right. You remember, you've learned from the Word of God this and this and this and the other. Don't go that direction. Don't go the other way. You follow the ancient paths. You follow the direction that the Word of God gives to you. So the, you'll hear the Word from behind you. That's the Word of God saying, this is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Now Jesus, therefore, look at John chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus therefore said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Speaking of himself and the truth, of course. Walk while, <clears throat> walk while you have this light, in order that darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness, wrong direction. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. If you operate on what the world wants to give to you, the cosmic system, if you operate under the influence of the world and the flesh, which lives on the inside of you, and of course Satan and his strategy, you really don't know where you're going. And you really don't know how you're going to end up. So again, let me read that. Our Lord says, walk while you have the light. That's the truth, by the way, of the Word of God. The truth of, of doctrine itself. That darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in skotas, the cosmic system, Satan's system. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, talking about the world and the unbelievers. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, because you were formerly darkness. In other words, you lived in Satan's world. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light. You are light in the Lord. Now you have received spiritual life, and a spiritual, and a spiritual life uh, that God has given to you becomes light for you, if you follow, of course, the light. But you now are in the light, in, you are light in the Lord. And here, notice this challenge. Walk as children of light. If you're in the light, you have eternal life. You're identified with our Lord Jesus Christ. Walk in that light. Walk in His truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so therefore, walk in that light. So walk as children of light. Because the fruit of the light, the production of light in your life, consists of the goodness and the righteousness and the truth. All right, so therefore, you and I have the walker's choice as you leave here today. You're a walker because you're living. You've got to leave here and keep on living. So you're going to keep on walking one way or the other. You're going to walk in the right paths. Or you're going to walk in the bypaths. You're going to walk one way or the other. You're going to live your life. You're going to make your decisions in one direction or the other. You're either going to maintain balance in your life, spiritual life, maintain the spiritual momentum in your life, and of course, go in the right direction in which God would have you to go with reference to His will and His purpose and His plan. So you and I have a walker's choice. So what is the walker's choice going to be for you? Are you going to walk in the divine power of light, God's light, spiritual advance in your life? 
Or are you going to be like old Roscoe here when he walks in the wrong direction? A lot of believers are doing exactly what Roscoe is doing today. Walking backward with reference to their spiritual life. Walking in human power, human opinions, human ideas. Walking in the darkness of Skotos, Satan's cosmic system. That, of course, is not spiritual advance. That is spiritual retreat. All right? We'll stop here. We'll pick up Wednesday night at this point in our study. All right, let's close in prayer. <coughs> Father, thank you again for the opportunity of studying these things together. What a challenge these passages are for us. But what a wonderful privilege, Father, you have given to us to be able to learn these things and to understand these things. Thank you so much for the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that he will be able to function so effectively today as our mentor and as our teacher. He will lead us into the truth of these things and challenge us and convict us with your word so that we will hear that voice that is standing with us and standing behind us telling us, go in this direction. Go in the direction of the word of God in order that we might be able to live our lives in a manner that would be worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.